now there's more energy. Now, how many of you remember your teenage years? Okay. And how many of you thought that they were easy, smooth sailing? Okay, not too many. Young startups that have secured initial success and are facing fast growth go through a similar stage. They need to change and mature in order to take advantage of the opportunity, but those changes can be difficult. Startups typically go through three stages. An early stage, a high growth or teenage stage, and an adult stage. During the early, whoops, yeah, during the early stage, the startup is still searching for product market fit and for a repeatable business model. It's trying different things and doing whatever it takes to get the product out and secure those initial customers. In the adult stage are mature startups that probably will already have gone through a liquidity event, an IPO or an M&A, and they are growing through more repeatable processes. They are executing against a proven business model. And then there's this in-between teenage stage where the company is no longer searching for product market fit, but rather scaling, trying to attract customers or users at a rate and in a way that will allow them to eventually be cash flow positive. And that's a completely different ballgame than the early stage. In fact, about 60% of startups that succeed in that early stage fail during the teenage years. And to understand why, let's take a look at what are the strategies or the characteristics of that early stage. The company has to move fast and iterate and potentially pivot. It has to have a team of people willing to wear multiple hats and do whatever it takes to get that product out to secure those initial customers. Communication is very informal, but everybody's talking to each other, so the team is aligned and that makes them very agile. And there's typically a group of early employees who know everything there's to know about the product, about the customers, about the business. But because the team is small, that tribal knowledge is easily accessible. When I first jo joined Nuance Communications as the product manager for speaker verification, I used to go and sit next to the head of research and pick his brain to understand the product. Unfortunately, as the company triples or quadruples in size, that cash will do whatever it takes approach that works so well when the company is 50, 100, 150 employees becomes totally chaotic <laughs> and not effective. So those strengths that fueled the initial success of the company now become obstacles for it to get to the next level. So, what are the transformations that the startup has to go through to emerge as a beautiful, or at least as a successful, mature company? And there are five key transitions that startups going through this stage need to be able to embrace. And while I'm gonna focus primarily on the third one, because product touches every aspect of the business, we as product people need to be involved in each one of those. And the first one is moving from people to process. Now process can be a bad word for many startups, but the reality is, as I had mentioned, that most startups have this core team of people who know everything about the product and about the business and the customers. They are the go-to people and need to be involved in almost everything. But when that core team fails to scale, they become a bottleneck that prevents expansion. So the company now needs to embed that tribal knowledge into the processes and the organization of the company. And that means documentation, documenting how things are done, documenting the product and the code. It means training and putting in place a formal onboarding process for new employees. And it may mean specialization, bringing on board roles that did not exist before, sales operations, legal, the company also has to institute things that are very frequently taken for granted, and specifically culture. Startups tend to have strong cultures that were created by the founders, but it is naive to believe that that culture that was propagating organically during the early stage 
will be preserved when the company grows fast. So there has to be a deliberate effort to communicate the values and to make sure that the culture is reflected in everything that the company does, in the hiring processes, in how managers are trained, in how employees are evaluated. At Lever, we're very, very big on diversity and inclusion. We have a 50-50 ratio of women and men with 41% of engineers and 56% of all managers being women. Yeah. And by the way, I'm hiring. <laughs> we are also very serious about having a large proportion of underrepresented minorities. And we want this to continue because it makes us a better company. So as an example, one of the key reasons we chose Toronto as the location for our second headquarters was that Toronto has a very diverse community. The second transition is from relationships to brand. Many B2B startups lead a lot of the sales through personal relationships that the CEO has created or the head of sales or introductions from the VCs. And that's a very good way to attract the initial customers. But as the company grows, the company needs to now develop a brand that communicates the value provided to a much broader audience. So in this uh, stage, it's important to bring experienced salespeople and experienced marketing people who understand demand generation, who understand brand creation, and in the case of B2C, who understand social media marketing. The third transition is the one that we, as product people, have the responsibility to drive. And it is the one where I'm gonna spend the most time. It's moving from early product to scalable product. And notice that I'm not saying moving from MVP to scalable product, because typically, by the time a startup is facing fast growth, they are past the minimum valuable product. But to understand the challenges from a product perspective, let's go back and look at how early stage startups build product. They need to move fast and iterate. There is no time for engineering to build things in a scalable way. And in fact, engineering is allowed or even encouraged to find hacks and shortcuts that will accelerate delivery. The focus is all on customer-facing features and functionality. So there's no time to think about tools that will enable a technical support team or an implementation team to service the product. And in the case of B2B, securing those early adopters is absolutely critical. They will be your partners as you evolve the product. They will be your reference customers. So you will be willing to accommodate unique requirements that they have in order to secure them. So at the end of this early stage, if your product were a building, it probably would look something like this. <laughs> it would have customer-specific functionality, that even if you build it in a way that anybody could use, you know that only a few customers will touch it. It will have pieces that are very poorly built. These are all the shortcuts and hacks that engineering was allowed to do. And the foundation will not be very stable. In fact, the foundation is probably not, not going to take a lot of load as you add new customers. So this is what we typically think of as technical debt. Now, your building will also have pieces that are in ongoing construction. This is the work that engineering has to do every time a new customer is onboarded because they have not built the tools that would enable a tech support team or an implementation team to be self-sufficient. I also consider that technical debt. So why is it that these issues that were created during the early stage now become really bad during the high growth stage? Well, let's first look at the cost of customer-specific functionality. Again, as I said, securing those early adopters is absolutely critical in the early stage. But once you start getting into hundreds and thousands of customers, you can no longer accommodate every unique request that you're getting from those early customers because they will take over your roadmap and you may miss the market. So this is now the time for you to start pushing back. 
and that can be very difficult. But I have a couple of tips that have worked for me before. First, communicate proactively your roadmap to those customers. Some of those customers think of your roadmap as this blank piece of paper for them to fill in. If you tell them what is coming and why, at a minimum, they will realize that they should not expect that you will accommodate their entire wish list. Leverage customer councils or customer roundtables. At Intap, one of my previous companies, we served the largest law firms in the US, UK, and Australia. As you can probably imagine, every single one of those law firms felt that they were the most important customer we had, and that of course we had to accommodate every single one of their requirements. So we started bringing them together in these peer groups of law firms that respected each other. We would share the roadmap, and we would ask them to share with us their biggest pains and needs. And it was very interesting to see a customer that had been pounding their fist, requiring that we add something to the product, realize that none of their peers cared about that functionality. It was also very helpful for them to see that we were not building a custom tool for any single one of them, but rather a product to serve the entire market. But in spite of those strategies, once in a while, you need to be prepared to say no. And what that means is being honest with your customer, explaining why you cannot accommodate their request, and educating your executive team and your CEO as to why you need to say no to this customer, what the cost would be on your roadmap if you were gonna try to accommodate that. Because you need your executive team and your CEO to support your decision when the customer calls to escalate, and they probably will. Let's talk now about technical debt. It is natural for every startup to accumulate some level of technical debt, because if in the early stage your engineering team had been building everything completely scalable and had been building all the tools that would be needed in the future, the company would have run out of money before getting the product out. But if you have too much technical debt when you face high growth, you're gonna start feeling the pain. In its most benevolent way, Technical debt will slow you down. It's harder for engineering to build new functionality on top of code that's poorly architected and is fragile. But in its most pernicious way, technical debt will be visible to your customers. At Intap, we launched a new product for conflict search that allowed law firms to make sure that they didn't have a conflict of interest when bringing in a new client. And we were late to market. So we rushed to put as much functionality as we could to surpass the competition. And we were successful. We started displacing the competitors in all these big law firms. But then those big law firms started having some major issues with performance. And they started talking to each other and started talking to our prospects. And they effectively froze our sales pipeline. So we had to make the decision to stop all new feature development and for an entire release, just focus on performance. And we were successful, we recovered those customers, we unfroze the pipeline, but law firms move slowly. If this happens to you in B2C, as you're ramping up your user base, those users who are impacted may never come back. So the first step to address technical debt is to realize that you need to start allocating engineering bandwidth different. In the early stage, most of the engineering bandwidth goes to build new functionality. But as the number of customers grows, as the complexity of the product increases, you need to start allocating bandwidth oops, okay, to address some of that technical debt to start building those tools that are going to enable your tech support and implementation teams and to maintain and enhance functionality that you have already delivered because no feature is ever done in version one. But this also means that you're going to reduce the amount of brand new functionality that you will be releasing. So my tips to deal with technical debt is, first, partner with engineering to understand which parts of the code have the most technical debt and are at biggest risk. Plan to invest in those areas of the product as part of your roadmap. And that means trading off some functionality. And then communicate proactively 
to your sales team and your executives because they need to know that they should not expect as much new functionality as they might have been accustomed to. And they need to understand why this investment you're making is very important for the company. So this is the transition that we as product people are directly responsible for. But the next two also need a lot of involvement from product. The fourth transition is moving from ownership to partnership. In the early stage, startups want to control everything that touches the customer, product development, sales, services. But as the company starts growing, there's an opportunity to see if partners can help you scale faster. And there are different types of partners. Go-to-market partners can resell your product into a broader market. Services partners can take on implementing the product and doing integration. And then there are the technology partners. Here is where product has to make a decision whether to build or partner. In several of my previous companies, we chose to partner with business intelligence providers because we found that it was much more effective for us to embed a BI tool than have our engineering team work on developing reporting and sophisticated visualization, which, while important, were not at the core value of our product. The final transition is from opportunistic to strategic. And this has two components that could seem contradictory, focus and expansion. In the early stage, startups are trying different things to see what sticks. But once they start getting traction, they really need to focus on the product and market they are having traction and growing. And they need to stop side projects that will become a diversion. At the same time, the company has to start thinking longer term how they are going to expand. Most startups start with one product, but that one product by itself is not likely to take the company to the size that their VCs would expect. So the company has to start thinking from the business strategy and from the product strategy perspective how they are going to grow to the next level. At Intap, we had started with a set of niche products that serve the law firms. In less than four years, we more than tripled the number of products, building an entire suite for law firms, and we more than tripled revenue. But we still knew that being in the legal industry was going to be limiting. So we then started expanding into adjacent industries that had similar needs. So as product people during this stage, you need to make sure that you're focusing on scaling this product that's having success, as we had discussed, but you also need to start thinking about what is going to be the product strategy that will get you to the next level, whether it's a suite of products, a platform play, new industries. So in conclusion, startups that are navigating these challenging teenage years need to embrace these five transitions in order to be successful. And product has a very, very big role to play. So for those of you who are working for companies going through this stage, my recommendation is be prepared, be proactive, and enjoy the ride. Thank you.